thank you, Molly and Blue Sky for and everyone at Blue Sky for having me. I'm super excited. I love Blue Sky. I've been here many times over the years. Coming to Portland, I love Portland, um, and this place is just uh, really a, an amazing venue to have this body of work, which I kind of this is really the first major exhibition of this um, work in one place. So really uh, grateful to, to have it here. Um, I'm going to move around a bit and I hope that's okay uh, because I want to speak to the work specifically. I'm not going to speak to every single piece uh, and it will take too long. I probably will talk for around 25, 30 minutes, something. Um, I do enjoy questions so if people have questions about a specific piece I am happy to hopefully be able to answer in a meaningful way. Um, so I, I thought I would uh, start at the beginning by just giving a background um, on the project as well as exactly what you're looking at. So the oldest piece um, in the show is this one over here. And so uh, in 2012, I started um, photographing ice, um, specifically glaciers, because I was became interested in the archive, um, sort of an archive of Earth's atmosphere that ice represents. So when a glacier is formed, you, everyone's seen snow here, familiar with snow, um, how it falls, and if you can imagine a snowflake, um, as it's falling to Earth, it has its little crystals, it traps air. Right? So. Um, it hits the ground, it traps a certain amount of air that's uh, in the atmosphere at the time. And in past climates, um, that snow, when summer would come around, it would not melt. And then the following season, that snow that didn't melt got compressed into something that's called fern, F-I-R-N. And then eventually over the years, gets compressed more and more into ice. And so you get these layers that build up uh, into, well, it forms eventually a glacier. And glaciers trap past climates because 10% of that ice that's in a glacier is made up of air. And so we have on this planet very, very, very ancient ice. And so if a scientist were to go and take um, ice from deep within the glacier, they can melt that and they can look very specifically at the content of the atmosphere that was present on Earth at that specific time. So it is very much an exact archive of um, an atmosphere. We can look back now, scientists have retrieved ice that is 2.7 million years old. So we have a very, um, we, we not, it's not a, a linear trajectory, um, I'll talk, I can talk about that a bit more, but um, we have snippets of Earth's atmosphere that far back. Um, so in 2012 I was invited um, by a friend of mine to go photograph glaciers in Glacier National Park. Uh, my friend Todd Anderson, he's a printmaker at Clemson University. And his idea was that we were going to document the last remaining glaciers in Glacier National Park. At the turn of the 20th century, there were 135 glaciers in Glacier National Park, uh, which is in northern Montana. And um, currently there are about 18 glaciers left. So rapid reduction, um, more than 80% of the ice mass uh, in Glacier National Park has disappeared since the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and we spent three summers uh, hiking around about 150 miles every summer uh, into the backcountry. And um, I'm a photographer documenting the. documenting the remaining glaciers in the park. And we were able to get to about. Um, 15 of those places, 15 of those glaciers. There, some of them are really hard to get to, a lot of um, strenuous hiking. 
Uh, and that resulted in this, this artist book, and a lot of my practice is making these large-scale artist books. And so I've been working on photographing ice since then, all around the world, in different places, uh, specific geographic regions that are in transition as climate change has an effect uh, of melting those glaciers. So I've been making that kind of documentation. Um, I got to a point pretty quickly in the project where I realized that I didn't know that much about ice. Um, I didn't um, really understand what was happening, what we were losing in terms of the archives that I spoke of, of this, um, the air that's trapped in the ice, how it was disappearing as the ice melted. At a certain point I realized it's just um, another picture of a melting glacier. And at what point for the audience is there like, just not anymore, right? It's just this beautiful glacier, it's melting, and what more can we learn from that? So I realized that I wanted to learn more, and I started to seek out scientists who knew more and who I could learn from. And so in 2015, I was thinking about places that I really wanted to go photograph glaciers, and number one on my list was Kilimanjaro, because being from the African continent, um, I wanted to, I, I tried to go back there as much as I can, and so I started looking around uh, images of the glaciers on Kilimanjaro, and came across this incredible image of this kind of cathedral-like ice on top of Kilimanjaro, and it had a, a name, um, copyright on the photograph, Douglas Hardy. And um, I did some research on Google and I managed to find a contact and I emailed this guy out of the blue and he emailed me back within a couple hours. I was, I was kind of astonished. Turns out he was a, a, a glacier scientist at the University of Massachusetts and he had done his graduate work at Montana State University where I teach and he was excited to actually talk to me. And so uh, it was um, we've become good friends since then, and I, I said, would you ever allow me uh, to come along on an expedition with you? And he said, of course, as long as you can fund yourself, uh, which is always a challenge as an artist, is to find funding. Um, and um, he turns out, a couple months later, he was going to Peru, uh, where he has a research site on Calcaya Glacier. Uh, he has two research sites, one on Kilimanjaro and one in Peru. Uh, on this Calcaya Glacier, which if anyone's been to Cusco, it's about a three hour drive south of Cusco. So it's um, uh, fairly, fairly easy to get to, I guess. Um, anyway, I went, on, I went on, along the, on this expedition and I photographed at this research site and I talked to, the, there were a group of scientists, uh, it was a, about 10 different scientists on the, on the expedition, if I remember. And I told them about you know, what I was interested in and would they ever be interested in collaborating with me on ideas related to their research, um, and specifically the idea of deep time, and climate change, and um, the sort of the archive that... Um, yeah, go ahead. Could you define deep time? Well, so, <laughs> yeah, deep time is really relative. Um, but if, um, if we think about humanity now, we're very focused on the near present. So today, tomorrow, maybe a week from now, maybe we'll think about our summer vacation a year from now, what we want to do, right? So um, there is an uh, institute in San Francisco called the Long Now Project, and they're building a clock in a mountain in Texas that will run for 10,000 years. So their idea is that they're trying to get humanity to think about not just tomorrow, not just next week, but what humanity will look like in 10,000 years. Will we still be here? So their idea of deep time is maybe 10,000 years. I'm thinking anywhere from you know, 1,000 years to uh, 2.7 million years uh, in terms of ice. That's the, the sort of the oldest archive that we have uh, of um, yeah, sort of Earth's atmosphere. So it's a range, it's relative. Anyway, so um, I went and this is Kelpaya Glacier right here. 
and I went to the glacier. I spent uh, two weeks, uh, well, not quite ten days, on the glacier with these guys, and I was astonished at how uh, crazy they were. <laughs> Ice scientists are the most hardcore people I've ever met. They um, so this is at uh, eighteen thousand feet. If anyone's been to elevation, that's fairly high elevation, uh, and it's hard to breathe. And they would wake up early in the morning, every morning, and they would climb up to the summit, and they would work for 14 hours. And it wasn't uh, easy work, it was manual labor all day. Uh, they were digging uh, snow pits or uh, drilling ice cores, uh, and they did that for about two weeks straight. Um, and I've worked with uh, scientists on this location in Antarctica, uh, where they're again working about 15 hours a day because it never gets dark. Uh, it's midsummer, it's at high elevation, and the wind is blowing, and it's about minus, about minus 10 degrees, 10, 20 degrees Fahrenheit every day. Uh, sometimes going to about um, minus 50 when I was there. Extreme cold conditions. And they just keep working, it doesn't bother them, they just keep going. So, um, pretty amazing. So, I went to Kalkaya and made these photographs of these glaciers. And I came back to my studio and I made these large prints. Uh, and I shipped the prints to my friend Doug, uh, who become a friend. Um, and in this case, Karsten Brown, who is another scientist, also from Massachusetts. He teaches at Westfield University. And I asked them to engage with this idea of their research in relationship to climate change and deep time. And so um, the piece that Doug did is not in the exhibition because I, I don't uh, own it anymore. Um, but this is the piece, uh, the first piece um, that I uh, collaborated on with the scientists. And so you're looking at a unique artwork. This is a one of a kind um, with the annotations that the scientists did directly onto the artwork itself. There is no second piece. Um, the paper I use generally is a traditional uh, Japanese paper uh, called uh, a washi. It's a 1200 year tradition from Japan. It has a nice kind of texture to it that lends itself well to uh, ink um, being written on. Sometimes I use a different paper uh, because the, the photograph itself doesn't always print well on the washi paper and so I'm very cognizant of choosing the right paper for the image and so I, I might shift papers a little bit. So I'll move over here. Um, so a lot of my work takes me to distant places. Um, I travel a great deal, uh, which uh, is a uh, a difficulty for me mentally uh, with climate change and getting on a plane, I feel a great deal of guilt. And so I have to try to kind of, kind of come to terms with that, though I, I haven't really. Um, so there's challenges with, with that, and uh, um, I try to uh, offset that um, in various ways. Uh, another conversation. So I do a lot of work close to home as well in Montana. There, being at an institution, um, there are it's a research one university, a lot of interesting things happening, a lot of uh, interesting people I can collaborate with. So um, this is uh, Pamela Avila Santibanez, and at the time she was a PhD student at Montana State University, um, studying ice from Antarctica. She is from Chile. She has uh, since graduated with her doctorate, and she went back to Chile for a while. And I think she teaches in California now. Um, so this is what uh, a piece of an ice core would look like that's extracted from a glacier in Antarctica. This specific um, ice core is taken from the West Antarctic ice sheets. And I think um, on the right hand side here, uh, it came from a, the, the, the bottom of the hole was 1,884 meters. And this particular piece of ice is 10,833 years old. So um, her specific research, she is 
in a clean lab. So she made me photograph her through a glass window. I wasn't allowed in the room because there's the possibility of contaminating the ice in the process of melting it. And she's melting the ice and she has these beautiful diagrams here of what she's looking for. She's looking for bacteria, viruses, bits of pollen that are blown from the African continent or from South America onto the ice and they've been deposited. And she is extracting DNA evidence, basically looking for different indicators of climate at the specific time that those bacteria or pollen or viruses were deposited on the ice. And she was really amazing to work with and this is thing, some, something that I've really loved about this project is engaging with these scientists and their own kind of personalities that they bring to uh, interpreting their research onto the photograph. And she, she was particularly expressive and uh, engaged in the process and has continued to engage with me over the years since she made this piece um, and really was, was wonderful to, to work with. And so that you guys don't have to move, I'm going to jump kind of to the end, which is this piece here. This is quite recent. Uh, in 2018, I received this Guggenheim Fellowship, and I, my boss gave me a year off to go and travel the world and make this, these projects. Um, and I, at the same time, I received a National Science Foundation grant. Uh, the, they have an incredible program called the Antarctic Artists and Writers Program. Uh, and about every year, they take four artists or writers down to Antarctica to collaborate with scientists to bring the scientists' research to the public. And each year, they try to take a different kind of artist or a different kind of writer. And so I got to go with my friend Todd Anderson, who's the printmaker I talked about at the beginning, who I've been collaborating with now since 2012. Um, we went to McMurdo, which is the largest um, American research base on the continent, and um, we got to spend a month there, and it's very, the most interesting place I've ever been in my life, crazy, crazy ass place. Uh, uh, very egalitarian kind of culture there at the base, they don't, you, you, everyone has to work together under really extreme conditions, um, so really wonderful people. But we got to spend a week in the deep fields uh, of Antarctica with a team of ice scientists led by uh, John Higgins from Princeton University. And they are drilling for the oldest ice ever retrieved by humans. And this, is, this site is called the Allen Hills. And it's a unique uh, geologic kind of formation because the ice uh, that accumulates on this glacier comes from many hundred miles away. It's basically forced there by an accumulation zone, pushing the ice into this um, kind of well of mountains. And it gets pushed up against the mountains. And because of the extreme weather, the wind is always blowing, and so the ice is ablated. It's blown away. And so there's no accumulation of snow ever. There's never ever any snow here, even though it's on the continent in the Transantarctic Mountains. And so what they found is that at very shallow depths, at 180 meters, they have retrieved ice that's 2.7 million years old, which is astonishing, right? Previous to this, um, on the West Antarctic ice sheets, they've retrieved ice that's 800,000 years old. And that's a linear record. So in terms of a linear record, at the top you're basically looking at zero. And as you go down, step by step by step by step, you get to 800,000 years old. <coughs> the Allen Hills record is not linear. Because it's being, the ice is being folded and pushed around, you guys basically getting these waves of ice. So you can drill down, and you could go from 800,000 year old ice, suddenly the next layer could be two million year old ice. And ideally scientists are looking for a linear record because that gives us a perfect record of Earth's atmosphere back into the past. 
Um, and these scientists are interested in greenhouse gases, obviously, that's what we're interested in these days. They're looking at what is the CO2 content, uh, and the CO content, CO2 content now is, is much, much higher than it was back then. There have been major fluctuations uh, in the past. Um, so it is, it is somewhat problematic in terms of um, there not being a linear record, but it is a, a record far back. Um, on the surface here, because there's this ablation, which basically means scouring of the ice, blowing of the ice away, you're looking at ice that is about 100, 150,000 years old. And so, um, I, you know, as long as I live, I will never forget the experience of taking a piece of the ice from the ice cores, putting it in a glass of whiskey, <laughs> and hearing it melt, and it, 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 it snaps, crackles, and pops as it releases the air. That's this really ancient air. And it's just like this kind of profound experience of, okay, I'm drinking, <laughs> This 150,000 year old water that's been frozen for that long, right? And this ancient air is kind of just re being released. It's, mm -hmm. And so they, they all laugh about it. They, they have a great time, you know, drinking. And they drink a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so the US government, you know, will allow the scientists to take a certain amount of alcohol to their research site because it's really tough conditions and you have to kind of lubricate the process of making the scientists. So, uh, drinking is kind of encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions at this point? Yeah. I'm sorry, did you explain how you know, how they know that the air is two million years old? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question correctly. Yeah. Um, so the way that they know that the air is two million years old is because they have these very fine the The dating of ice that old is, is very difficult. And John Higgins, who I was with, has been pioneering the methods um, with which it's dated. So when you're looking at ice that's um, more recent, 10,000 years, it can be carbon dated. It can, it's very, very accurate. Um, and they can actually count the layers as well. Um, ice that old, what they're doing is they're using um, argon isotopes. So they're basically, they're basically looking at two different argon isotopes and at how fast they are degrading. And they can tell the relationship between those two isotopes within about 100,000 years how old the ice is. So it's not super accurate, but roughly. Um, you know, when you're talking about 2.7 million years old and you're only 100,000 years old, 100,000 years off, you know, it's not as accurate as they would like, but um, they're in the range. Um, and the, the degassing process is getting above my understanding. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, I have a question more about like, the making process of these, which is like how much um, autonomy do scientists have oh, yeah. you know, yes. and like how are those compositions created and like do you have any outlines or any findings yeah, yeah. of that? Yeah, so um, the conversations really happen with the scientists well before. Mm -hmm. Often when I'm in the field with them, I spend a lot of time with them. Um, if I'm in Montana, it's often a camping trip up in the mountains for a weekend. If I'm on an expedition um, you know, in Antarctica, that was three weeks in, uh, in Antarctica with the scientists having conversations. So really talking about what the idea of the project is. When I'm at that place, the aesthetic decisions are mostly mine based on what I see there and the conversations I've had with those people. You know, what is visually interesting and what is maybe scientifically interesting based on what I've learned in speaking with them. So then I go back to the studio and I look at what I have on my computer in Photoshop and just sifting through the images. What do I find visually appealing? And I might have maybe five or six images. And so then I have an email conversation with the person I'm collaborating with, just back and forth, you know, what do you think is interesting? What do you think you might find appealing to work on and write on? And um, after that point, 
I really don't um, direct the scientists at all. So I will send them the print and that's it. And some, some of the people I've worked with, it's like, I will have that piece back within a month. You know, they know exactly what they want to do and um, they just, they go for it. And other scientists, it's been a year, a year and a half. And this is why, you know, this is uh, seven years of work with this exhibition. Right? I've been doing these since 2015. It's a slow process. And I have two scientists who just form the face of the map. They don't, they stop responding to me. Right? They just decided it's not going to happen. And so, um, it might be a thousand years before they get back. Yeah, exactly. Deep time. So I don't, I don't want to hassle them, and if, it, if it's not going to work, it's fine with me. It's, just, it's part of the process. But, um, you know, so, some of the more complex ones, like um, the ones from the, the ruins Ories, yeah, they're behind over there. This one is the one I imitated myself. But if you look at those two pieces over there and on the left, so these um, three pieces uh, are all by the same scientist, and it's the same scientist as this one. So we've become good friends um, since that first expedition. And um, um, when I was on my uh, fellowship, uh, I convinced Carson to go to Uganda with me. To there, there are three places in um, Africa where there is still glacier ice. One is Kilimanjaro, one is Mount Kenya, and the other one is the Mountains of the Moon or the Ruin Ruins Ories in Uganda. And uh, I got super sick. It's the closest I've ever. People always ask, "Have you had dangerous experiences?" I, I thought I was going to die on the mountain. I got asthma-induced pneumonia. And I was coughing up blood at 16,000 feet. It wasn't a lot of fun. I wasn't sure how I was going to get down. But the, these are more complex. Karsten came to the mountain with um, historic photographs that he had researched. Uh, and he wanted to include these historic photographs in the collaborations. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, OK, these are the photographs. Um, I made my photograph of the glacier, and these are the historic photographs that he had found mm -hmm. and he provided to me and that he wanted to include and have a conversation with those uh, historic photographs. And so I, in Photoshop, did some various layouts. I would send those to him and say, which do you think is looking good? And we you know, often came to sort of an agreement in terms of aesthetically um, what was working okay. I sent him the prints and then he would annotate those. So that's like the most complex um, conversation that I've had with the scientists. Mostly I leave them alone. I sort of do, I make the aesthetic, aesthetic decisions and then they decide what they're going to write and I don't direct them at all. And once they're happy with it, I'm happy with it. And you know, honestly, um, I haven't had I mean, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about every single one of them. I don't think there's been um, a, a failure at all. Uh, I have encountered a great deal of insecurity uh, in terms of the men, several of them not having any art experience and them being uncomfortable with the quality of their the script of their writing, that it was ugly and not readable. <laughs> And um, so some of my process has been um, over helping them overcome those insecurities. Right? And um, my wife is here, Nancy, and uh, that piece is a collaboration with her. And maybe she can talk a little bit about overcoming some of those insecurities or her experience about collaborating with me uh, in this, on this project. Well, I get a drink of water. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, welcome and ask any questions that you want. So I was well aware of all this work and really enjoying seeing it come along. Um, and I'm um, teaching archaeology at the same university. I went into the field with a colleague. Um, we had an opportunity to work on private land where a bison killed. And it was in the middle of Montana.
folks that live there um, have been very cautious about letting uh, any archaeologists know about the sites on their land because they have a mistaken belief that we could somehow take it from them. Um, what's on private land is, is the owned by the owner. Um, sites that are on federal land or state land are protected by laws. Um, so this particular individual who owned the land in the dead center of Montana um, had had a friend who had been uncovered a bison kill site and had been then kind of mining it for arrowheads for over a decade. And he went to Montana State University to get an agriculture degree. He was farming this big land around there and had cattle on it. And he started to feel like, at first he thought, is there a way I can make money off this? And then he kind of came around and thought, this would be a good project. So he called, um, I took the call at the university and a colleague and I decided it would be a fantastic project for a, a field school training for students to take them into the field, to dig this site, to learn something about it and to hopefully stop the damage and maybe build relationships with local people and get them involved in, in a really interesting way and to build some trust. So that was the background into why I went to the field. So I'm in the field for um, a month and, and Ian comes to visit. I said the site was really cool, you should come and see it. There's all this bison bone just meters deep um, and, uh, and we were just getting huge amounts of arrowheads these particular points called Avonlea points, which is a period in Montana where people are making incredibly symmetrical, beautiful arrowheads. So farther back in time, they're making very, very big ones that you, you think of when people were hunting during this Paleo-Indian period, megafauna. During this period, they're hunting bison. There's no horses. They're hunting bison, though, um, and they're hunting deer and antelope, but, but mainly bison. Um, and this area that we were in wasn't really a particular homeland to any of the seven tribes that are still in Montana or the 12 others that are out there. It, it was an area where people came to hunt, so there was a big crossroads. But these, these Avonlea points are very well known for a specific time period, for their symmetry, for their beauty, and they were sometimes cached in burials that date to this time period. So we knew we were doing with something interesting. What we found was that at the site there were also um, an early period where people were hunting with cattle animals and spears. So this place was a place where two different technologies. Anyway, aside from that, Ian photographed some of the bison bone that had just been churned up from the people who had been mining it there. And um, uh, another professor had come out and laid out a lot of bison teeth and parts of a jaw because students were learning about the different bison parts. And then I had persuaded the man who had been mining it and collecting it, who had hundreds of points, to let us take his collection just to document it, and we'd give it back to him, but we wanted a database. So we wanted to measure them all, understand the variability of the points, and then use that as an imperative collection to what we were digging. This was a way to not lose the data that he had already mucked up, but to you know use it and make it productive from the stuff that we had very carefully dug these meter-long pits into. The, the kill site to, to document. So these are from his collection, and Ian was pretty astounded with how beautiful they were, <laughs> and he started laying them out in the studio, and he started photographing them. So then unbeknownst to me, he creates this image. And, um, and then he's like, would you like to annotate this? And I was like, yeah, no. You know, it was um, excitement and um, being very flattered, and then also the incredible insecurity about um, what would I say, what would my handwriting look like, all this other amazing work that I've seen. So I think it stayed up laying on the ping pong table in your studio for like a year. And, um, and then he keeps reminding me of the deadline. Like, for <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I, send, I, I dove back into the radiocarbon dates we had gotten, the obsidian. Um, sourcing, which told us where the obsidian that had showed up on the site, and all the things we learned about it, as well as students that we had um, done independent studies with who then measured every way that you could measure these things and looked at them. Um, and I took all of that data and kind of went through it, and I had to like let it just kind of sit in my brain for a bit. Um, and he, he was pretty convinced I wasn't going to get it done, I think. And then he left the house for a bit, had to go run some errands. And then all of a sudden, within like an hour, it, it just it just came out for me. And I, I had to look at a lot of ideas about what other people had done, where they had written, 
um, what they had written. And then I started to just think about what was the most important thing that I thought people should know about what was up here. But so it was a really interesting process to take what you, you know, what I would write in a paper about this site is so different than, but not that different, how I would annotate it. So I hope the piece works for people. It was, it was incredibly fun to do. These are uh, bison teeth and parts of jaws. So, you know, you don't really want the head, you'll take the tongue out, but so we would find a lot of jaws, which are actually incredibly useful if the teeth are still in them, because how they erupt and how far they're erupt and worn can tell us what season of the year that they were killed, especially the young ones. So we got a lot of great information about that. So even though all of this stratigraphy was mucked up from where people had been just digging and looking for arrowheads, we were able to tease out a lot of useful bits of information to then compare what we had. Um, so deep time and the, the naturalists of the long now, I mean, we love this idea. And I'm, I'm so excited about deep time. When he was talking about ice that's 800,000 years old, I'm like, oh, they're like, that's like Australopithecine breath, Neanderthal breath that's being captured in that air. And, you know, so we would have these amazing conversations and it was just really fun to think about it. But these naturalists that you were talking about, 1700s, 1800s, they would write beautifully and annotate their drawings and things. So the, the inspiration for this project was, was really fun to, to think about too. Normally when I see photographs, I don't think it's in terms of their possibly being a target audience. And here I do, and I wonder, is there a target audience? <laughs> do you have a thought of the target audience for you? I'm sorry? Who, who do you think? What's, what is your well, I didn't know. I didn't know if this was educational or trying to teach. Um, um, there's definitely a didactic aspect to it, and I think, but I think some of them are more. I mean, it's a, it's a longer conversation. Um, I think that. I have a desire to change minds and um, to at least make or help people become conscious of deep time, climate change, those kind of things. Um, and so part of that, my approach is through aesthetics and beauty. I'm always interested in those those things. So anyone who will be attracted by the beauty of the pieces, I think I'm, I'm interested in that sort of process of bringing people in. Um, Definitely, uh, you know, I definitely want to teach. I am a teacher, and so I think that's, that sort of informs so much of my process and everything I do is, is creating a conversation. Uh, and I think this is a lot of the crit critique I have of photography is that people who are not well versed in photography, who have not been trained in photography, it's a really kind of a struggle to interpret sometimes. It, 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 there's a barrier. And so the text, I think, is another entry point. And so I think there, hopefully, maybe, is a broader audience for it somewhere. Gallery, sometimes, it's, that's problematic in itself, right? Because a certain, a certain audience enters the gallery. <laughs> And that would make a whole larger audience access to the work. And so I, I don't know what the answer to that is. That, that's problematic in itself. Um, but yes, I, I hope to teach. I hope to bring information. I hope to, uh, especially, I get to travel to places and learn about things that most people will never get to go to. How many people get to go to an artifact? So I hope to, to bring that information about my experience both visually, that experience of the place, and what we can learn about that place to, to other people. Um, you know, they're traditional framed gallery works, right? So it, that's a certain audience. Um, I, I would be great to, to reach beyond that. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, it does. Yeah. What I like about them and, and how I see them is that the photograph so often is there's a beauty to it. 
but there's not the detail that you need to understand it. And it isn't about photography as much as it is geo, geological life. We just don't bring that to, right, to it. And, but the idea of writing within the photograph, on the photograph, and in one sense on Earth itself, a description of that very thing, and how, and how elegant all of those little things come together as a way of explaining not only the geological part of it, but also the photographic part of it. And, and as I'm talking about here earlier, is that, that I just think there's something very essential about text and visual information and how they blend in the situation. You don't expect so much information from the photograph. And you get so much information because you've written it on the photograph, right. and they blend in a kind of way that I think is just uh, terrific. Well, I, I really appreciate that, and that's that's my goal. Oh. And, um, and you know, the the inspiration, a lot of the inspiration for this project came from 19th century naturalists who were trained in the arts alongside being trained in science. And Alexander von Humboldt is my hero, and his map of Chimborazo really was this kind of inspiration for this project, right? Where you have this very carefully annotated. Um, uh, layering uh, interpretation of all the science that he, that he did on Chimborazo in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And this was this kind of profound experience for me when I first saw this artwork. It really is a, a large part of the inspiration of this project. And um, scientists, science really now has become so focused and become narrower and narrower that there's no entry point for everyday people. Like, I've read all these science, not all of them, I've read a lot of papers um, related to um, ice science. And it's very hard to understand, it's very hard to engage with. And so, the inspiration for this project is really trying to help scientists become artists and finding you another larger audience, yeah, I think it's a larger audience, for their research, what they're interested in, what they're doing. Um, yeah. And it's also how I like to become a scientist. One more thing is that as you approach the photograph and get so much more, you think it's not there because the print is so small. And then as you get to it, then you realize you get all this other information. Well, I think that, that way of, of approaching argument and finding is much more earlier than you thought. You well, I, really, I really appreciate it. You know, it's you, great when, when I hear someone in the in business. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to say bravo for Alexander from Humboldt. I have been invited on it. And I think with the environmental movement and the like, interconnectedness and so on, he is going to have a renaissance. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if, 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 you know, in, I've traveled a, a quite a bit in Latin America, and in Latin America, he is a hero. Right? There are institutes to, devoted to him. And in this country, you hear, you know, many things named after Humboldt, but many people don't know who he is. And so I, I would really highly recommend that you read the biography um, called The Invention of Nature, and a lot of the inspiration for this project came for, from that book. And about, and he was really a visionary, way ahead of the time, and many of the things that we take for granted in terms of how we think of an, an interconnected ecology came from him. And in Latin America, he, he's more famous than Darwin. You know, so, um, it's really um, a great book. Yeah. Wow. Uh, um, you, if you say who's my audience, well, here they are. Yeah. And, and and that whole idea that science is getting narrower and narrower and more specialized. But in this room and in lots of other rooms, there are people who know little about this. And the simple question of why might this be of interest to you would be interesting to um, an astronomer or a communications expert, or maybe an agronomist, or maybe a filmmaker. I don't, it just seems like, wow. Well, thanks so much. <laughs> <laughs> I have a technical photographic question. Yeah. Are, are we on questions yet, or are we like second? Yeah, we're on questions, whatever. Great. Oh, good. I think I've talked for way too long. Technically, with photography, how do you deal with the latitude or dynamic range from the big project? Because it's probably quite large out there. Especially some of these are kind of more midday, probably has to do with travel and weather. So I didn't care about that. 
Oh, um, so dealing with the dynamic frames, yeah. you probably don't always get to shoot in the morning or at night. Contrast, like, depending on, on travel. Um, and then how do you translate that uh, into this type of paper? Because there's probably a printing challenge too. Yeah. When you go from the third yeah. So um, I, I, I use fairly high end equipment. So um, a medium format digital camera, so the dynamic range is about 14 stops. So I have a lot of latitude to, to manage. In some of the pieces, I've started to use a Sony more often. Um, so that piece in the middle that is photographed with a Sony A7R4. So a little bit um, less of a dynamic range and um, very bright sunlight. You know, like it was sunny all the time. That's all you get all the time in, in midsummer. So that's some of the, the more challenging light that I had to deal with um, in terms of my aesthetic, it's not what I would like in terms of photography. Um, but generally in the mountains, I think, um, as you get higher in elevation and also in higher um, in uh, latitude, either north or south, I love Arctic uh, light um, for sure. But yeah, sometimes uh, because I'm hiking, you know, doing a 20, 24 mile day with a backpack, I'm exhausted and I literally I get to the spot where I have to photograph and I have half an hour and that's it and you get what you get right and so um, uh, you know specifically the ruins already pieces you know I was so sick I didn't think I was actually going to get to that place I got to that place with someone helping carry all my gear was carrying nothing setting up having them help me set up the tripod and make 10 pictures and that's it you know it's in the space of half an hour so i just try to aesthetically in a computer deal with what i get i don't manipulate my images at all other than sort of the color correction and having the the latitude that that specific camera gives me i i think i can push it in the, the direction i want enough to get what I need, and so that's a that's a luxury for sure. Um, but yeah, sometimes, um, yeah, sometimes I don't get what I what I want. Do you ever use like always a filter? I do not. I don't use filters at all. No filters. Um, yeah, so that's really the benefit of that camera that I can I, I can I can pull that highlight detail in, and I don't have to. Um, I, I use a camera for the phase one uh, and. Um, I used to be friends with the rep from page one. He's like, he was even surprised. You don't use filters? I'm like, no, don't use filters. Uh, he was uh, even someone who knows what those cameras can do, which is pretty astonishing. Um, he was he uses filters and stuff. So, um, yeah. I don't. I try not to change the, the landscape from what I experienced. I try to interpret it in the, the similar way to what the original was. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, yeah, I was just going to say that when, when you were talking about, you know, the, the guy in the arrowhead screwing up all the information, that that's the thing about photography in terms of who the audience is, that the, that the camera records all the, in, all the information that anybody would want, regardless of what their interest was. Mm -hmm. So the, the camera is, is giving you one half of an infinite number of conversations on different topics. <laughs> And it's, it's very, it's one of the things that's so powerful about it. I mean, you know, that's why, you know, when the police come on the murder scene, they take a picture of it. They don't know what's important. And various kinds of experts will extract different kinds of information out of it. And, but the photograph is just sitting there saying, well, I'm ready to talk to anybody about anything. And uh, when we had, when we showed the new photographic survey project, which was side by side pictures made in the 19th century in our national parks in the West, and then modern pictures. The, the, every, almost everybody's experience was saying, oh, look, everything is it's lush and beautiful, and then we haven't screwed it up. And my friend, who's a plant expert, came in and said, oh, this place is completely screwed up, only non-native plant thoughts are everywhere. <laughs> so the opposite, depending on how much you knew, you came to the opposite conclusion. I, I was just thinking, as you mentioned earlier, that part of your practice is also making books. How like, 
perhaps think about, like, I don't know, spreading your books, whether lending them to libraries yeah. or schools or whatever. So um, I will be back in Portland uh, in July, um, probably July 9th. Um, my book dealer is stores in um, Portland. Um, the partner to this lady here. Uh, <laughs> I can give you all the after if you want. <laughs> so um, he's not here. He's in Mexico right now. Uh, but I will I will be doing page throughs of my books that he has. They're very large, um, massive books. And yes, um, those books um, go to teaching universities. And they end up in front of students, and that's my desire, is that students get to experience and learn from, from those books. Yeah. Um, yeah, eventually maybe I'll do some kind of trade publication that has a larger audience, but mm -hmm. I, I really am kind of addicted to, or um, have an affinity to, to the handmade, and things that have this kind of handmade tactility to them. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And so I'll, I'll do some page throughs of those books, and I'll see you again about those, those, that process. Mm -hmm. Can I just throw out the name so people can Oh, them? I wish you would. Ask. <laughs> so, <laughs> Passive, Passive is Bookshop, which is um, currently, it's newly moved to Northwest 18th and Upshire, so it's um, by appointment, uh, but you can call, and he's usually, except right now when he's in Mexico, but David Abel is almost always there, I can attest. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he'll have to deal with, with Ian's work, and the books are really, really an experience. I mean, it's not like any other books you've seen. They're, they're quite amazing. Um, so I would encourage people to um, to come to that. And what's the date? It's like July 9th. Yeah, yeah. It's so. the day before I have this work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it'll, it'll, it's really worth going, and his shop is a beautiful, uh, beautiful space with a lot of interesting books. Harper, will you throw it out on the Blue Sky, uh, in a Blue Sky email? Uh, email on her as well, yeah. Right. Yeah, I yeah, once I set the time, I will send you that information. Yeah, and also, if David has an extensive, um, David Abel, the, who runs the bookstore, my partner, um, he has a mailing list, a really extensive mailing list, so if you want to be on his mailing list, um, you can give me uh, your email, and I'll ask him to put it on. Um, I think I've been told to end it here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to hang out.